It's amazing. It's amazing on so many levels. The sound that this guy brings up emits from his Gibson Birdland. It's Ted Nugent, one of the best rock and roll people in the world. In fact, uh, according to M Live, the readers in uh, Detroit, the number one guitarist in the world. Ted, it's great to have you back on. Alan, back at your greetings from the Nugent family and the Nugent band and the crew and everybody making the greatest rock and roll in the world. And thank you, America, for this gravity-defying career of mine. I'm having so much fun, it's stupid. How are those uh, three Labradors, those great creatures? They're, you know, they're right here at my feet, uh, Thunder and, and Gonzo and Blackjack. They are the world's greatest dogs and my stupid cat, M. But the Nugent family is doing great. The American dream is alive and well. If it wasn't for the federal government, our life would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got my dog here, too, and I didn't know you had a cat. I, I, I knew you loved dogs. And I saw the... Let me let me just, just start off on something human, something a lot of people can relate to. And that is why you love dogs and you have dogs obviously that are indoors and not just outdoors you don't just use them as a utility for hunting the relationship i think is worthy of uh sharing with people well you know everybody i know has dogs in fact right now in your neck of the woods up there and around charleston uh, along I, actually, the eastern seaboard. It's Charlotte. We'll edit that out. Yeah, but that either way, all all up on the eastern seaboard, I got some Nugent family members and buddies of mine, hunting buddies, and just you know, family friends, and everybody's got dogs. And my wonderful daughter, Heather, I just had to put down her uh, seven-year-old uh, golden retriever, Sophie. And it's a heartbreaking time, and it's not like losing a family member mm-hmm. or a human being, but it's close. And we have a real spiritual relationship with the animals in our lives. You know, here, I'm, while I'm talking to you right now, Alan, I'm looking at six white-tailed deer walking behind my pond, and ultimately, might I kill them and eat them? Yes. But do I cherish the ground that we share and their lives and their spirit? Yes. And I think the companion animals, those of us that love dogs and horses, and even my buddies who have alpacas and, and <laughs> llamas and stuff, we love animals. Uh, yes, we eat animals, and even as we speak of dogs, you know, our, our Vietnamese and Korean friends and the President of the United States, they eat dogs, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the relationship that we have with our companion animals is really very important, and it breaks our heart. Uh, Shemaine just had to take Thunder, our white Labrador, into the vet, and uh, it's very emotional. She gets very upset sure. when they have a, a sore paw or something. So my relationship with my dogs is, I think, perfect. I love my dogs. I make them work hard. I train them. They're obedient. But boy, do we wrestle and have fun and hug and just have the greatest time. I think a lot of the spirit of my music is reflected Mm -hmm. in the relationship I have with my hounds. Well, you know, the thing is about dogs, and I could say this, you know, I can't think of any other animal that loves people, will do anything for people. I can't think of another animal on the planet that'll do it like a dog. Yeah, you know, when I when I tell Gonzo to go fetch something or yeah. when we get ready to go duck hunting, he about turns inside out with excitement. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we love our dogs. In fact, one of the hardest parts about touring, I, get, I go on the road all summer every year, I miss my damn dog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Listen, I got this is one of the things I want to concentrate on today. We are going to talk about some of the hot issues. Obviously, you are so involved in so many different things. There's some Can't very avoid it. hot issues out there, yeah. Oh man, there's some of the things and I, you know, I hear people when they hear about the things that you've said and they said, "Alan, you know Ted, what's going on?" And it, it, it's frustrating because people who know you, people who understand where you're coming from, who follow your career, they know you have always said things that are on the edge and you express yourself. Uh, I think some people just take it literally and take it to the next level. These people don't know you, obviously. Well, you know, I, I have a lot of support out there. I've never had more support in our life. Our Ted Nugent Spirit of the Wild show has been voted number one again on Outdoor Channel because uh, though people hate me for being a hunter, thoughtful, real smart people, uh, educated people know that hunting is conservation. So that's a perfect example of the line drawn in the sand, is that there are people that really thank the Nugent family for promoting and teaching children about conservation and the, and the hunting, fishing, trapping lifestyle. And then the, while people love us for that, there are people that are so ignorant, so uneducated, that they actually hate us, Alan, for eating venison. So if you can have that kind of outrageous polarization over a simple issue of perfect conservation,
starvation and the ultimate diet of venison, then you know you've got a a, a society that has a lot of lunatic fringe oh, yeah. that are just uneducated. So uneducated. Well, just look at the slaughterhouses. Most people eat that food without uh, you know any remorse, and that, those sure. animals are slaughtered. Well, you'll find that people that have a problem with Ted Nugent are usually uneducated, ignorant people, and I just wish they'd get some education. Let's talk about some of these uh, things in the news. The uh, CBS interview. Uh, where you were a little out of character, and I know you uh, ap- apologized, and there was a backstory. I don't think everyone has heard, so I want you to go over this because there was something that was going on behind the scenes that probably affected what you said. Well, first of all, uh, I think my friend Alan will will support the statement that I'm the greatest interview in the world. Yes, <laughs> entertainment value, provocative. Plus, on the side, the huge, huge benefit of this guy rocks. This guy's one of the best rock and roll guitarists in the world. I'm also a street guy. I'm a street fighter. I come from Detroit, and I didn't, uh, you know, turn down the uh, curse and the death march of drugs and alcohol by saying no. I had to get in fights. I had to stand up and fight for myself, oftentimes against criminals and uh, and substance abusers who were had lost their minds and were getting aggressive and dangerous. So I'm a street fighter. And in that interview on CBS, on, first of all, I would like to make the first statement, now that on behalf of you and my friends, particularly my gun-owning friends, my Second Amendment friends, and my sporting, hunting, conservation friends, I sincerely apologize for the first time in my life snapping live on the air. But what led up to that will never be shown by CBS because they went into this dishonestly anyhow. There was a whole bunch of interviews that were not... Um, shall we say PG-13? It was more street slang and some uh, some uppity spirited dialogue, and so I went right into the CBS interview, quite volatile from the previous twelve or fifteen interviews. Mm-hmm. And when they went down the road of uh, playing devil's advocate or the idiot's advocate, um, I, <laughs> I I made a tactical error and went back into street mode. And that is not effective. It was a tactical mistake on my part. And I believe, Alan, in the thousands and thousands of interviews that I've done, I believe that was the first tactical mistake I've ever made. Uh, because CBS is going to be PG-13. CBS is going to be to uh, middle America for the most part, though their, their ratings are diminishing rapidly. Uh, I, I had a responsibility to remain uh, professional and effective in my tactical responses to those questions. And I might also add, and I'm not an excuse maker, I take 100% responsibility for everything I say and do, but do you realize that I was in the throngs of knee hell? Both of my knees are blown out. I had just taken some medicine, and during the interview, Alan, I was passing a kidney stone. Yeah, I didn't. Are you kidding me? Unbelievable. So I literally had a metaphysical moment where my tactical prowess was dropped, and I went back into street fighting mode, and that wasn't effective on CBS, so um, I didn't represent my sporting friends and, and, and the conservatives of this country in an accurate and articulate way, so I apologize for that. But also, I think, in these dire conditions with this a government out of control, the criminality of our of our government, the, the yeah. power abuse... The passion and, was there. The passion was there. Yes, the passion and, and was there. It was, it was necessary at this time in, in date, I think. Yeah, and Shemaine uh, was, you know, she signed a... This is one of those times where she said, hey, Ted, uh, you need to apologize to the, the some of the crew members. And, and, yeah, it's true, and I did. Yeah. And they accepted it, but of course... By the tactical error, that's the only the the interview lasted over an hour, and it was a <laughs> brilliant interview. But of course, what do they use? The five seconds where I snap. Well, you know, so the, I hope everybody had a good time. With the, that. the, that's true, and, and that's why I want to get the story and get get done with it, get past it. But I got to say this: when CBS uh, presented it in the morning. Uh, from the clip I've seen, at least they presented the end, what you went through with the kidney stone and that you apologized, you called the next day. No, they were very much uh, all about that, so you got to give them credit Good. on that. God bless them. Jeff seemed like a nice guy, so did Molly. Now, before we get into some of the uh, rock and roll here and this, the great new music and also the, the, the just the, the, the classics from the damn Yankees and Ted Nugent, a few other things in the news. The... Uh, this was one of those things where, you know, again, it all makes sense. It was blown out of proportion, but you were fined. You broke a Alaskan bear hunting law of some sort, and uh, people try to make, you know, a big deal out of this. Hey, you made a mistake. Explain that. It takes some explanation. 
explanation, Alan, because believe me, you're on the phone with one guy, but there are tens of thousands of good law-abiding hunting families out there that are being railroaded by an out-of-control U.S. Fish and Wildlife and U.S. attorneys appointed by Eric Holder and Barack Obama that are intentionally trying to destroy the hunting industry. And I'll get the evidence in the future for you. Mm -hmm. But we have quotes from people who have heard the U.S. Fish and Wildlife agents claim they want to destroy the hunting industry because animal rights freaks and vicious anti-hunters have found their way into government policy-making decision positions and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. But to my particular case in Alaska, I have hunted my entire 63 years and throughout the world, every law about tagging a game animal is the same. And it says, upon taking possession of the animal, you must apply the tag. Well, when you're reeling in a fish and you're allowed six bass, if the fish gets off the hook... It's not part of your six bass bag limit, is it? No. Well, in this particular instance, because the law has been universal forever, I've been hunting Alaska since 1977 and hunting big game my entire life. I bounced an arrow off the rib of a black bear in Alaska. It turns out that only in those islands that I was hunting is the only place in the world where a new law exists that says if your bullet or arrow touches the animal, that your tag is now no good. Hmm. Well, not only had I never heard of it, hmm. the Alaskan friends that lived there and hunted there all their life had never heard of it. And on the official court records during the trial, the judge who's a resident of that area, a hunting judge of that area, admitted on court official records, he's never heard of the law. No one has ever heard of this law before. And the state of Alaska did not prosecute me, Alan. The U.S. attorney under Eric Holder and Barack Obama pushed for the prosecution and decided to prosecute me the day after I endorsed Mitt Romney for president. Timing. So there's a witch hunt going on where good, decent, law-abiding hunters are being charged with felonies for using the wrong broadhead, Alan for having a lighted knock on their arrow, for having the wrong tag from the wrong branch. they hunting with the right licenses, right permits, but somebody gave them the wrong tag, and they're being convicted of mm -hmm. felonies, Alan, as if they were rapists, murderers, or armed robbers. So the, the federal government is absolutely out of control. Cass Sunstein is the regulatory czar under Barack Obama, and the regulatory czar, his, his title is regulatory czar. He doesn't have to get votes for a law. He doesn't have to run it by Congress. He can decree a new law. And Cass Sunstein is on record that animals have the right to sue human beings. Wow. Are you kidding me? Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So I'm a victim of a witch hunt because I get the truth out that our attorney general is a criminal and is running guns to Mexican drug lords. Do I really have to add this up for anybody? Well, you have always been outspoken about that, and that's the other thing I wanted to touch on. When they went out there and said, you uh, threatened the president, anyone who's heard that what you said, that original comment, knows that you... Sometimes we'll we'll talk using an analogy, and you don't even use it. It's more of a metaphor. It's to show your passion. It's to paint a picture. Don't they don't take you literally? And that's what they did with that comment. Well, it was even worse than that. You've got your Maxine Waters. Um, here's a woman who, during official testimony in Congress, recommended that America become socialist. Are you kidding me, Diane? Feinstein, who wouldn't allow Californians to conceal weapons permit, but she had a weapons permit for her 38. Nancy, you don't need to read this. You need to sign it, Pelosi. Are you kidding me? Have you ever listened to Wasserman Schultz talk? Have you ever seen Sheila Jackson Lee out of Houston talk? These people are communists. They lie. They, they adhere to the Saul Alinsky playbook to lie as 
viciously as possible and get all your fellow communists to lie about someone like Ted Nugent so that the Secret Service has to respond to the lie. The Secret Service knew before our meeting that I threatened no one. The federal marshals that I conduct raids with, my friends in the FBI, ATF, Secret Service agents, they shook their head and they went, God, this is ridiculous. We already heard your speech. You didn't threaten anybody. But when the liars lie loud enough, the Secret Service has a professional responsibility to follow up even on lies and accusations. Right. So they did. And i got to tell you, Alan, they were the consummate professionals. They did took care of business, and they did what they had to do, and they determined what they knew coming in that I did not threaten anybody. Yeah, absolutely, and that's clear. Now, as we talk about music and incorporate, everyone, so many people, unfortunately, who only watch the cable news channels, hear these bulletins, read these stories, the music is it's just secondary. He's a generic rock star, and there's a side that is just completely ignored sometimes. That's why today the big focus is going to be on the music. We're going to play all the music in its entirety. I love the music. I, and, and, <laughs> you, first of all, with all the things that you got going on besides the tour, we'll talk about that. That's just kicking off. But what about just in your day-to-day -day life? Do you pick up the guitar every day and at least play? Or, is it, or are you working so much with the guitar you don't have to just do it for fun? No, I play my guitar every day. I crave the stuff now more than ever because I'm so involved. This responsibility of we the people is very serious now more than ever when, you're, when your government is this corrupt and, and a power abusing. Um, my, my duty to say thank you to all those heroes of the military that came home in flag draped coffins is more powerful than it's ever been. We host here at the Nugent Ranch the heroes of the military that have had their legs and arms and eyes blown out and that have sacrificed so dearly for the U.S. Constitution, the American way, that I am driven, I am compelled, duty-bound, to show my appreciation and use the freedoms that they have provided at such great sacrifice to make sure that we, the people, get rid of the, the enemies that are in our government right now. So when the dust settles, <laughs> which, which, by the way, it never does settle, <laughs> but I still seek that, that escape from that wonderful Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, you know, Mose Allison, Lightning Hopkins, James Brown, Wilson Pickett, Motown, Funk Brothers. I still grab that guitar, and I'm gone. It really cleanses my soul. Yeah. Like times with my dogs and my family, it, 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 it fortifies my spirit. It's the fuel. It's it the really is the fuel. And i got to tell yeah. you, you watch the audience on this tour. We've done over 20 shows already. This is the greatest tour of my life. Mick Brown, Greg Smith, Derek St. Holmes, the music has a force to reckon with. It's unbelievable, the positive spirit and, and wonderful, smiling, dancing people out there. I'm the luckiest guitar player in the world. This is the greatest tour of my life, Alan. It's a the great music tour. is more powerful than ever. I've been writing, reading the reviews. And just go to tednugent.com for every detail about the tour, the music, and, of course, everything else about the world of Ted Nugent. And, by the way... The, the uh, booking for DPAC uh, in August, you're going to be coming to North Carolina uh, again. You're here this week, but you're going to be coming back. I think it's August 1st. We'll have the details. But that's a great venue because it's small, but the acoustics are amazing. And well, the Nugent Band doesn't believe in days off. We, we, <laughs> we don't like a day off. I mean, a day off is painful for us. We love to rock every night. And again, if you just look in the face of my band, when you watch Derek sing these classic songs, Stranglehold and Hey Baby, Just What the Doctor Ordered, Live It Up, uh, when you see Mick Brown on drums and Greg Smith on the bass guitar, not to mention that goofy guitar player they play with, but the energy level is you'd never know that we weren't 15 years old. It's just timeless that spirit of our music, we love playing every place. We played for 20,000 people the other night. Mm -hmm. I played in front of a half million people. We love to do the House of Blues and these other small places. It is really like our origins, the origins of us learning Chuck Berry music. So it's going to be the best gig of all, I promise you. How old were you when Baby Please Don't Go came out? I was uh, just 18 years old. I had just graduated from high school in 1967. And I uh, had the Amboy Dukes, my buddies from Detroit, 
and uh, we were trying to play that that black American rhythm and blues. I think we did a pretty good job. Oh, it still holds up, man. It still sounds good. It is so much. It's such a great, high quality song. It's amazing. Eighteen years old. And journey to the center of your mind. You were sixteen years old, right? Well, when I when I created the song, uh, you know, I was doing like that. Every guitar player just grabs a chord and starts pounding on it like that. But by the time we recorded it, you know, that was after the first Amboy Dukes album. The album was the journey to the center of the mind, and again, surrounded by unbelievable virtuosos, uh, Mr. Gregor Rame on bass guitar and, and Dave Palmer on drums. My God, what a rhythm section! But if you listen to Journey to the Center of the Mind, the great vocals of Steve Farmer and, and Andy Solomon on the Hammond B3 and John Brake, we really were the Funk Brothers. And, mm-hmm. and to, to come up with those kinds of orchestrated pieces of music at, at, at the age of 19 when I recorded it, I, I really can't believe it when I stop and think about the it. smooth guitar, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those songs that you get goosebumps from. And, I still do. Yeah, man, and he re-recorded it, actually. There's another version of it. We'll let you hear both in just a bit. Uh, but the thing about that song is it really was part of the top 40 music scene that was so successful, it actually started a culture on, on, on its own, and kind of bridged itself into AOR radio or progressive rock radio because you push the boundaries of what Top 40 was playing. And you well, and a great, co- you know, I talk about the collaboration that is just so in, uh, important in music. Mm-hmm. you got to have diverse attitudes. And I don't know if you and I, and you're a music master, but I would challenge you, Alan Adelman, to find a song that had that was created musically by such a right-wing deer-hunting pistol-packing guy and a ultra-left-wing doper like Steve Farmer, who wrote the lyrics. Mm. I really believe that the song was about, because I was totally ignorant about the dope world. I avoided it like the plague. And I wasn't even aware that the band was doing that much stuff at the time. But he came from a, a, an LSD um, dopey um, world of escaping and going to the center of your mind with drugs. I thought it was about going to the center of your mind and reviewing your life to make sure you're being the best that you can be. Mm-hmm. So there was a passion from two extreme political viewpoints and ideologies that came together to make a gorgeous piece of music, man. Well, when did you realize what the song was actually about? People started asking me about the album cover with all those. I didn't know what they were. I, 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 I didn't relate the, the uh, dope pipes on the, re- on the record cover to uh, the Cheshire Cat in uh, Alice in Wonderland. I didn't realize you smoked dope through a glass pipe like that. <laughs> and people started asking me, well, you're against drugs. Well, what about the journey to the center of the mind? I go, well, what about it? I, I think everybody should uh, step back and review what they're doing in life and take a journey to the center of their mind and make sure that they're being the best that they can be. And they went, no, no, man, the dope, the dope pipes on the cover. And I went, what are you talking about? He went, that, the hashish pipes or whatever they're called, bongs. And I go, what are you talking about? Um, and then I looked at it. I thought it was, I thought it was, I saw some uh, TV show about blown glass art. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought it was like a Peter Max, you know, yeah. what do they call that, op art or pop art? Yeah. I had no idea. And then I started to realize, and I go, ah, maybe that's why the guys are always late. They're stoned. <laughs> yeah, are it was you a, kidding me? It was like psychedelic uh, yeah. uh, figurines or something. Yes, and even they attributed uh, my guitar uh, passage um, to psychedelia because I was using feedback, but I didn't see it that way. I thought it was like Junior Walker in the All-Star saxophone line, ah. which I still think it is. Ah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Fascinating angle, huh? Yeah, it is. Now, this is the other thing, and we've talked about it before with all the great interviews over the last 20-something, 20 26 years, 27 years you've been on. Mm-hmm. You didn't get paid for that song, and so many artists, we talk to them all the time in your company, but they didn't pay you for that, huh? Just tragic. Uh, that's the real curse of uh, the music industry is uh, thieves taking advantage of young creative uh, artists um, who love our music so much that we just want to record it and get it out there and, 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 and celebrate our music with the people like a piece of art. Right. And uh, uh, the, the, um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name now. I can't even think of it. Uh, he was a bad guy. He's the same guy that ripped off uh, um, the big brother in the holding company. And uh, we we didn't get paid on those records. I mean, we got, you know, I think we got food money. I think mm. we had 10 bucks a day food money or something. Yeah, a little salary during the time. Yeah, Bob, Bob Shad. 
The guy's name was Bob Shad at Mainstream oh, Records and Maury Apatow. Um, they just ripped us off, and it was not fair because that was our creativity. I, uh, we did get our uh, songwriting royalties. They couldn't steal that from us, but they took all the publishing, which means we got um, about a quarter of what we deserved. And the guys that didn't write the music got nothing, Alan. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. 